Like, is that there? They're gonna use they're gonna use this mic yeah. for yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, back So about 25 so far, you want one of us and Eduardo to go, yeah. and this one, yeah. and then leave one here to do questions and answers in case yeah. the next one they can do that. That's a bit idea, yeah. yeah. That's cool. yeah. And we've got other volunteer as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, so I'll introduce you. Okay. Welcome back to Campus Party 2013 at the Galileo stage. Next up, we have a hardware reviewer, journalist, and writer, Anthony Lever, giving us a talk on journalism and technology and modern. So a round of applause, please, for Anthony Lever. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, I hate Max. I'm all about PCs. Okay, I think that's up there now. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all enjoying Campus Party so far. Uh, my name is Anthony Leather. I'm a uh, technology journalist, uh, hardware reviewer, and writer. Uh, I currently write for uh, BitTech.net, oh, Bit uh, Custom PC Magazine, and Forbes.com. I don't know if you've heard any of those. Um, this is actually my third Campus Party. Um, I attended the uh, first event in Madrid 2010 where the uh, Icelandic volcano managed to erupt and uh, I had to drive home from Madrid to London, which was fun. But this time I live tw 20 miles north of London, so it's all good. So I'm here to, uh, today to talk to you about the uh, world of technology journalism, um, how I became a technology journalist and uh, writer and uh, introduce you to PC modding. Uh, we'll talk more on that in a minute. Um, I'll then speak briefly to uh, two friends of mine, uh, Lucille Campbell, who's uh, just down there, um, who's the European PR for uh, modding company Lamptron and a superb PC modder himself. And uh, actually, unfortunately, I won't be talking to two people. I've just realized that uh, my friend Nate George, um, he he's, won't, won't be able to make it until tomorrow, unfortunately, so we might be cut short a little bit on that one. Okay. So to start then, uh, what is technology journalism? Um, hopefully it's fairly obvious uh, what it is, but it's um, essentially investigating and writing about the latest technology. So that's computers, hardware, everything you know, technology related really. So uh, it's often called the latest tech because it kind of involves pretty much everything really. So it's uh, usually website or magazine based. Obviously the internet's um, you know, massively expanding medium uh, still, even though it's been around for well over a decade now. And uh, the, the, the articles that I'm involved in, they sort of vary from overviews and uh, reviews of products. And um, it's all kind of based around uh, the PC ecosystem. So um, I, I spe uh, specialize in PC hardware. For example, I've benchmarked and written about the latest in, uh, processors from Intel or uh, gaming graphics cards that people use for uh, gaming on their computers. And um, Basically, uh, PC cases, monitors, anything that's kind of PC related, really. So it uh, sounds like I'm a bit obsessed with it. I guess I probably am. But the point is that a lot, a lot of other people are too. So uh, this helps to generate traffic on websites. It helps to drive sales in magazines. And um, so, yeah, it's all about this kind of ecosystem that, that surrounds the, uh, the PC industry um, with enthusiasts being concerned about what's, what the best hardware is to buy at the time to play the latest games, to do their photo editing, to edit videos and that kind of thing. So um, I'll just take you through uh, a quick behind-the-scenes guide about what I do when I, review, uh, when I review products. So uh, it basically starts, you get in contact with the PRs for a company. Um, Lucy, my friend down here, is actually a PR for a company called Lamptron, um, who make uh, modding products for PCs. And uh, they will basically send you an example of their, uh, their latest product for you, to fully, for you to look at. And uh, you can then test it and compare it against uh, similar products and that kind of thing. So uh, for our website, uh, you obviously need to write about the product. You also need to take photos, do a bit of photo editing. Um, that's generally what hardware reviewers do uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis. And uh, of course, if you've written a blog or if, um, 
uh, you work with Twitter and things like that, you'll be familiar that with the uh, content management system or CMS. Uh, most websites have them. They're pretty easy to use these days. And um, so it's very similar to a, uh, you know, a normal blog like WordPress or something like that, where you just enter copy, you edit photos and things like that. And uh, for the most part, brilliantly, you don't need to know any kind of web code or anything like that. You just, you know, even if you're actually setting up a website, it can be done all very much automatically these days. So on uh, www.bittech.net, um, which is where I review most of the products, uh, we also include graphs, um, which can help people kind of um, decide on which product's best for them. Uh, for example, with uh, graphics cards, um, people are more concerned about you know, how fast they are. Um, if they've got a big monitor, it crams in more pixels onto that monitor. So it's harder for the graphics card to keep the frame rates going. So that's when you need to start thinking more about you know, spending a bit more money. So um, how do I, or how do you, actually go about writing about technology or anything for that matter for a living? Uh, well, for me, it was um, definitely not something that came natural at school. Um, I wasn't actually very good at English. Uh, I was much more into science and maths, um, and uh, mainly because of my appalling handwriting. But um, I actually became very close to becoming a uh, fighter pilot after leaving university. Uh, but I also had an avid interest in technology, which is my first point. If you're going to be writing about anything full time, um, it's very important to be passionate about what you're writing in. You can be the best writer in the world, but if there's no passion there, if you don't have any understanding of the subject, you'll, you'll find it quite hard going. So um, I was a member of a forum uh, back in sort of 2003, 2004, uh, when I first got into technology journalism. And um, I just happened to uh, write a guide for someone. Um, on, I can't actually remember what it, what it is now, but the, um, one of the moderators on the forum uh, basically asked me if I'd like to write, rewrite the, what I'd written for this guy and um, put it into the magazine and get paid for it. So I was like, yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, a couple of years later, um, they had a uh, job vacancy and the rest is history, basically. So that's, that's how I got into it. Um, so what's the easiest way of writing about hardware for a living? Um, well, I'd say start off slowly and get some experience. That's what I did, um, just writing like small articles. Um, as I say, English isn't my best, uh, my best subject, so it took a while to kind of learn how to best communicate your ideas to, uh, to your audience. Um, obviously, the internet plays a huge role th uh, these days, and um, as we can see up here, the best way that I think to start about doing it is writing a blog about something that, that you're interested in. That way, if you do have something um, online that people can look at, if you do need to po uh, point potential employers in uh, some kind of portfolio, a blog is a great way to do it. And um, so f for me, it was, um, I kind of fell into a lot of the, uh, the jobs that I've worked out the last few years, but I definitely recommend sending your, um, uh, your CV out to potential employers, uh, magazines, websites that you might be interested in writing for. Um, at the, the very least, um, they might consider an, an internship. You don't get paid, but at least you get some experience. You can say you've worked somewhere. And uh, the situation I'm in at the moment is I'm a freelance journalist. Um, so uh, that's actually quite popular with lots of companies at the moment because it's got lower overhead. You don't need to have people in the office. You just pay freelancers um, and experts in the field to write for you uh, remotely. So that, that's worth considering as well. So uh, if you do end up writing, um, whether it's technology journalism or in a magazine or a website on any kind of subject, um, it's... Uh, inevitably come up against uh, proofreading, which I absolutely hate, um, just because I, you know, I hate everything like that. But unfortunately, spelling mistakes, grammar, and that kind of thing, they do matter. Um, and generally, you know, the way you say things as well, you need to, you need to be sort of, you know, really hot on the ball with these kind of, kind of things with every article you write. Um, so you obviously need to check your work uh, for spelling, grammar, and uh, just trying to keep things as, uh, as short as you can. Um, use a spell checker. Um, a lot of the online um, content management systems don't use in built-in spell checkers, but most of them do, some of them don't, so it's worth just running it through Microsoft Word or maybe even getting someone else to proofread it for you. Um, and I don't know about you, but my brain tends to think about three or four steps ahead of what I'm actually writing. So I can come back to an article after I've written it a few hours later and think, why is that paragraph there? You know, it needs to be like way back in, in the article. So don't waste words. Um, don't say too much. Try and make it as compact as you can. For, for a magazine, you know, you've got very set word counts for things. So you need to, be, you need to write as efficiently as possible, really. 
And uh, finally, um, no lulls in articles. It's they're great for text messages. Um, they're okay for um, forum posts maybe, but unless you're very outgoing and people know what you're about, just avoid them like the plague in, uh, in articles, especially if you're pointing potential reviewers at them as well. So, um, moving on to the second part of my talk, which is PC modding, which is something I'm uh, involved in quite heavily on uh, BitTech and elsewhere. Um, it's, um, kinda, it's, it is quite niche, it's becoming more popular. Uh, but it's, been, it's certainly been around for quite a long time. Um, I liken it to Pimp My Ride on MTV, if you've ever seen that, or, or American Chopper. Um, I haven't really thought of any better examples um, to explain it uh, in kind of the overall context of the, P of the PC industry. Um, Pimp My Ride, if you haven't seen it, it's about, you know, they get these kind of junk heap cars and um, they take them to a uh, sort of a, a car modding factory, whatever you call it, and um, they basically, you know, sp uh, spray paint them, kit out the inside with leather and all funky things. And um, that's basically what PC modding is about. It's taking an, e an existing case um, and uh, you know spraying it, cutting it, and doing you know all kinds of crazy things to it. Um, it's also like American Chopper, if you've seen that. Whereas um, some people are clever enough, uh, not me unfortunately, to actually build a PC case from the ground up, um, which is you know it's really quite impressive. So uh, to start with, um, PC modding kind of originated um, with the really old beige PC cases, hideous things. Um, and people were trying to improve the cooling. So they cut a fan hole in them, uh, they put a fan underneath and add a grill, uh, just to get a bit more airflow going through. And um, yeah, for the most part, it worked, re it worked really well. So um, of course, once, it, when it, once everybody sort of uh, saw what everybody was doing, uh, lots of other people wanted to have a go. And um, the, uh, it quickly spread to other, to other areas of the case, such as cutting side windows, as you can see here. Um, so you can see all the sexy parts of your, of your PC or your expensive hardware. And um, also to uh, you know, further enhance the cooling and people would even spray their own cases as well. And it's got to the point where now people will actually spend hundreds of pounds sending their PC case off to a professional spray painter um, to have it looking like this one you can see here all nice and glossy and red with essentially a, you know, a car paint job. So uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, most PC mods, as they're called, look vaguely similar for the simple reason they were just taking off-the-shelf cases and uh, modifying them in, in these ways. So they all look fairly similar. Um, however, as the hobby grew and you got more and more people involved, um, the skills that were available become, you know, became even, um, even more extensive. Um, to the point at which that people you know, such as engineers, carpenters, um, and you know, metalworking experts got involved as well uh, with some quite spectacular results. So uh, we've also seen uh, people using uh, CNC mills and laser cutters. Um, as you can see here, um, this is uh, part of a case that's been cut out of sheet metal and um, it's like really precise stuff, so better than anything you could achieve by hand. Um, probably cost quite a bit as well, but this is, this is the kind of thing that people are doing with their PCs now. And um, so CNC mills, uh, laser cutters, and they've also been employing lots of different materials. So uh, fiberglass, um, carbon fiber, as we can see here, this is actually a, it's a huge model. I think it's about six or eight feet across of a stealth bomber. Uh, it's actually a computer. It's got a normal computer inside. Um, and the uh, modder himself, I think his name is uh, Dave Biro, he actually made the entire thing out of uh, carbon fiber, which is uh, obviously quite impressive. So, um, a lot of people are actually focused on um, advanced cooling techniques these days as well, such as water cooling. And uh, this is essentially where you, um, you fit sort of big metal blocks to all the hot spots in your computer. And uh, it's a lot like a car cooling system where you've got a radiator that kind of radiates out, radiates out all the heat and that kind of thing. So uh, a lot of people are also trying to concentrate on making their PCs as small as they can. Um, and some of the, uh, the custom projects you see out there, you know, there's things smaller than a shoebox that are more powerful than anything you can buy in the shops at the moment. So it's, uh, again, it's uh, there's some really impressive work out there. And uh, we've got a couple of examples here to show you. Um, some of these I'd be quite happy to have as the uh, centerpiece in my, uh, in my living room. Um, the first is uh, Cygnus X1 on the left here by uh, Australian modder Attila, uh, Attila Lukacs. And um, he's uh, basically an expert metal worker, carpenter, lots of different um, skills all kind of put into one, uh, one project. And uh, for that reason, he's actually won our annual modding competition on BitTech um, two years in a row. 
uh, with some yeah absolutely spectacular projects. And uh, this one, uh, Cygnus X1, you can see he's fashioned all the wood paneling and the uh, the panels himself uh, from hand, and uh, the whole thing kind of opens up and yeah, it just looks absolutely absolutely spectacular. Um, another modder, Peter Hussar, with his uh, tenuous build, is very popular on our forums. Uh, it's what's called a uh, home theatre PC. So you'd have it next to your television and plug it directly in. And as you can see, it's got a uh, optical drive player so you can play, play your DVDs and things. And uh, again, it looks absolutely spectacular with a, uh, with a wooden surround and metal front. And uh, again, I wouldn't be, um, I'd be quite happy to have that sitting next to my, uh, my TV cabinet at home. Two more uh, projects that, have, um, that I'm quite that I absolutely love is um, uh, the first one is uh, Red Harbinger uh, Cross Desk, uh, which is originally by Peter Brands. It's a uh, essentially it's a PC and a desk. Uh, this stemmed from uh, a couple of projects that were um, introduced into our forums over recent years, and uh, Peter won uh, our annual mod mod uh, mod mod of the year competition quite recently. Uh, with his um, L3P desk, you might have seen it going around on the on the internet. It was very very popular at the time. Um, essentially, it's um, what's happened is uh, it's a growing trend with PC modders is that their uh, what they make actually goes into ma uh, mass manufacturing. So you'll get case manufacturers um, basically seeing this design and uh, seeing how great it is, how many people are interested in it, and uh, they say, well, you know, if we pay you to design it for us, you know, can we put it into mass manufacturing? And that's that's essentially what's happened with his uh, PC and a desk. Um, this desk is um, currently on pre-order. Pre -order. Um, to order it into the UK, I think it will cost about 1,600 to 2,000 pounds. But you're getting, you know, a, P a PC case um, and a desk in one that will probably last you a lifetime, I would have thought. So, and you can fit all the hardware inside. It's got a scratch-resistant top. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I wouldn't say no to one, to be honest. And um, another project is uh, Blue Horizon by uh, Keir Graham. He's actually a UK-based modder. Um, everything you can see here on the right was actually um, handmade and uh, milled by Keir. Um, it was made out of solid metal chunks. And um, as I say, it looks like he's bought it off, off the shelf, but the whole thing, um, including most of the cooling system, uh, was actually made by, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, I think he was 19 at the time working at school and he actually made that in his, in his spare time for a, for a project. And uh, that's an example of water cooling as well. You can see the, uh, the pump at the bottom. It's got a large radiator at the back and uh, the tubing kind of directs the coolant around the PC and um, takes all the heat away instead of using fans and heat sinks. So it's a lot more efficient and it can be much quieter as well. So um, I've mentioned about our competitions on BitTech. Um, there are so many projects now that we have uh, hold monthly and annual competitions whereby the uh, community can vote for their favorites. Um, our Mod of the Year article is one of the most popular of its kind in the world and attracts literally hundreds of thousands of people um, to, uh, to our website to have a look at all the crazy projects. And um, there are quite a few new genres of uh, PC modding now as well. So uh, I think it's safe to call them genres, uh, seeing how many there are. Um, but one of them is um, steampunk, which is um, where I'd like to bring uh, my friend Luciel on stage. As I mentioned before, he's actually the uh, PR for Lamtron, um, which is a PC modding company. And um, he's also a brilliant modder mod uh, in his own right. And his, um, one of his specialities is um, steampunk modding. So, Luciel, <laughs> thank you very much for, for coming. Cheers. So, um, yeah, I think we'll kind of keep it general, really. So, um, first of all, I know you've, you're sort of, you've got some steampunk uh, PCs in the, the big hall at the back, which I thoroughly recommend people going and have a look at. But how did you kind of get into PC modding uh, to start with? Where did you sort of hear about it? Well, actually, uh, I was really happy when I got the invitation for Campus Party because the way I actually got into, into modding was uh, about four years ago. I went to another Campus Party, uh, actually it was five years ago, and they had a, a workshop uh, showing you how to paint and all of that. I was always a bit, you know, keen on that, but you know, when you when you're a kid and you can't draw anything, you figure, like, well, you better not get into art or anything like that, because you're not going to do very well <laughs> about it. So I, I started painting with this spray cans at this workshop, and I really, really got into it. At the time, I was working at a computer shop, and they were quite known locally for doing um, what you've shown before, off-the-shelf mods kind of mm -hmm. thing, when you buy LED strips and fans and all that. Um, so we, we kind of started like, hey, we should buy a, a compressor and start painting. So this went on and on. And um, and I did a few mods, and then I actually found BitTech, recommended by a friend, and did my, my first uh, mod in a week project. And it, w it was literally just, uh, it was a really old case. It's one of the first um, um, pre-production modding cases 
that eventually already came with the wind. It already came with LED lights. Things. I bought it in a, in a British computer fair yeah. in, in Berkshire, I think like 2003, something like that. And I thought I'd, I'd bring that back to life, make it a modern kind of thing. And that, and that became really popular on it. And, uh, and this went on for a while, like doing different kinds of, of styles, like what we call clean mods, which is essentially no cabling or very clean lighting, a bit like that one, basically. Yeah, so you're hiding all the cables yeah, behind things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the um, problem with that is that it's very hard nowadays to get something truly special because uh, most people, that's their favorite kind of mod. So as you see, you see a lot of the same. And they, they are still truly fantastic. But when you see so many of the same, it's hard to to appreciate it, if you will, you know? Mm. So I went through different styles and eventually arrived at Steampunk, and that, that's, that's kind of how I got there. I just fell in love with it, really. Yeah, yeah. so um, would you say Steampunk's your speciality at the moment, or you've, you've had sort of um, dealings with lots of, different, lots of different styles? Yeah, I would say my specialty is more uh, DK effects, anything from making anything look uh, vintage, old. I mean, uh, the, the previous morning of the week was a Fallout theme PC. I'm not sure if you I remember have, that yep. one. Yeah. And that was when I started with the whole uh, rust effects. I, I did a lot of uh, investigation. I could do it. A lot of people actually suggested to literally rust the, the the thing. But I thought it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, we, we're trying to make a PC look cool. We're not really trying to actually destroy it by rusting it, you know. <laughs> so I, I learned one very important lesson. And this was uh, my local uh, paint specialist that tested me all the paint. They said this, the, the best looking effects are often the most simple ones. Mm. And for example, the, the wood, the that. wood that's applied on the on the mod I have out there, it is literally just a wallpaper uh, that has groups. So it's originally designed to give your wall one of those like like it's been fancily made kind of thing. And then with a, with a bunch of brownings on top, and it eventually looks like wood, but it's got nothing to do with wood. It's not anything like that. Uh, some other times vinyls that can be um, modified with inks and other kinds of, uh, of paints. And you end up getting a truly impressive, unrealistic result in something that probably took you to make 10, 15 minutes with a couple of inks and a couple of paints. As opposed to going to the wood shop, trying to find a sheet of real wood that's thin enough and does not brittle or break to give you the same look. Mm. So that's what I found, yeah. Okay, so if someone was starting out in PC modding, how, how would you suggest they got into things like painting? Is it just like trial and error, or that you can you look at guides and, and things like yeah, well, that? Well, there's a lot of guides, and there's a few mods as well that are specifically meant for, for beginners. Um, do you know, on, on, on BitTech, we normally have mods, and we have the whole progress, the whole workload, but not often would they actually say how they actually did a specific part. So you can see what's going on, but if you don't understand it, that's it. There's a few mods going on about which would specifically tell you um, this part you've got to paint, but paint it from 10 to 15 centimeters with the primer, then from 10 centimeters with the paint, and so on and so on. And they show you how to do it. And eventually you end up with a very simple mod in comparison with some of the stuff that they have on there. But it, you end up doing something and you can say, hey, I actually did that. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's the best way to do it. I think it's, it is obviously a lot of trial and error. Uh, no one's going to get it right the first time or the second or the third. Um, but I, th I think the best way to do it is a bit of uh, Google searching and some guides that are going about there are useful guys. Yeah. yeah, did you have many skills like before you started? Oh, no. no. So no. you literally started with, you that, know. That's the one thing. Everybody on the forums was like, oh, I wish I had skills like, skills like that. It's like three years ago, I did not even know how to draw. <laughs> it's like, you, you, I, think, I, think, I truly believe anybody can do it with enough patience. Yeah, no, I'd have to agree with that. Yeah. So um, where do you see PC modding in maybe 10 years' time? Because I know that there's, uh, there's been quite a lot of progress in yeah. the last few years. You know, like a lot more people are using water cooling now. Um, you, know, three, you know, people are even, even using like a pans down here. He's, uh, I know he's used a 3D printer. Yeah. Uh, so but wh where do you see it maybe going in, in 10 years' time? Do you think it will have progressed? Or? I, I would define it in one word, expensive. <laughs> I mean, I think it's getting more and more expensive all the time. I, mean, I, I, st I started with normal paints, ended up using o uh, auto, auto paint. Um, now with water cooling, I mean, let's face it, you, you see a mod with air cooling, it's just not good enough anymore. And you've got all these kits and you've got to buy the, the best, you've got to have the best pump for the best uh, water flow, you've got to have the radiators. And obviously in a good way, because more people are buying it, it's like with anything, if there's more being produced, it'll become cheaper. Uh, but I would think, it would be. It would get to the point where it would be extremely expensive, and there will. I assume there will be a lot of CNC work, a lot of uh, 3D machining work, and um, I think it's 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 just a constant, constantly evolving thing. And I think it's really reaching what it's meant to be reaching, which is being to pick with technology. Mm. If technology can allow us to print something with a printer, then we're going to use it for modding. I think that's how it goes, really. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, something I was sort of, I was going to talk about is um, is water cooling. Unfortunately, Nate's not here today. Nate George, I think he'll be here tomorrow. But um, I mean, I've I've got sort of personal experience of water cooling as well. But um, say someone you know they've got an air cooled PC and uh, you know they they come across water cooling. I thought you know first of all you know crazy people why are you putting water inside an you know electronic you know electronic device yeah. but um, can you sort of explain to me what why um, explain to the audience sort of why people would want to maybe water cool their their PC well I mean the first reason is because um, the, the high the high end hardware that we used to have a few years ago was the hardware that we really had to worry about overheating uh, it would, you would get a, an i7 CPU with a, with a, or even going back to the, the original quad cores uh, with a, with the fan and all that and you, you you know, the moment you're outside temperatures over 28 degrees or whatever, this thing would heat up to 50, 55 degrees. It sort of will, it will last two to two and a half years because it just burns away, basically. Um, so it gets to a point when you need water cooling. The problem is that because we're constantly demanding more and more power and we're still using the same concept of uh, silicon chips and whatnot, but smaller transistors that we're 22 nanomillimeters, I believe. Uh, so we're building up here, we're building up here. And what used to be high-end hardware before, now is mid and even low end hardware. So even the basic computers are heating up like they used, like the high end used to do. So it gets to a point where manufacturers have obviously realized about this because of the whole, uh, you know, Corsair H100 and all these uh, prefabricated um, water cooling kits, yeah. which are obviously not as efficient, but uh, they're easy enough to install and safe enough that anyone can, anyone can just put one in their PC. Uh, the, the reason to actually go to water cooling is because, well, this, this is just not good enough for high-end hardware. So putting them on, it's obviously the, the risk and the, the scare of what you said. I mean, we're crazy putting water in <laughs> electronics and all that. And you, and you, you, do, have to put, you do have to do it yourself. You've got the, the fittings, you've got the piping and all that. And nowadays, I think it's becoming more and more safe in a way. They've obviously gone through a few uh, disasters, if you will, or breaking motherboards or just burning down a computer or something. And... Um, I think it's one of those things that you say, read the manual, you know, uh, which is a bit RTFM, but I don't think we're allowed to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, I think if you read the manual and you go online and see a few bills and a lot of security checks, like once you put the cooling together, leave it outside your PC running for 24 hours to make sure there's no leaks with a bit of uh, tissue paper around so you can see the, sure. the leaks yeah. and all that. I think it's safe enough. Uh, it just, it's just one of those things that you've got to... Be, you know, I think it's like driving a car. It can be really dangerous, but if you're careful, you'll be fine, you know? That's true, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the final topic I'd like to cover, obviously, we're kind of on different sides of the, of the fence when it comes to uh, yeah. being professionals. So, yeah. uh, you're a PR, and I'm yeah. essentially a journalist. So, um, obviously, you'd send, you'd send me your latest product, like yeah. you have recently with, your, uh, with Lampton's fan controllers. So, um, maybe sort of explain to people what, what the PR looks, you know, to get, out from, to get out of from sending their products to someone like me. I mean, why would you send something, uh, right, well, send one uh, of your products to me? The way it works, obviously, when, when, when we release a new product, uh, we, we make a public statement, we put it on Facebook, all the social media, on a website, like, hey, we've released, a new, uh, we've released a new product, come have a look at this. But let's face it, at the end of the day, no matter how honest we can be, uh, the user is still going to think, well, it is still marketing, you're still saying all these things, but, and they, I assume they're partially true, but truly how great it is. So th there's one specific part of our, of our launch campaign that we need um, review websites uh, or, or even uh, uh, reviewers like yourself or freelance writers to write s uh, something about this product. And it's most especially important that this person that does it is known by the community. So they, they know they can trust him, they know he's not being bought, bought by the company to say whatever we want. And in that sense, we need, we need to send that product to you so you can test it and give your honest opinion. Um, and it's always especially suspicious when you see some reviews which is everything is good. Because you just know no product is perfect. I mean, um, I, I seem to remember the, um, on one of our previous uh, products, the CW611, I remember in the review you said uh, uh, something like, uh, well, this is really good. Sorry, it was the FC5. This product is fantastic, but the price itself is a bit worrying. So it's a price that is a bit high, and there's a couple of other things. And that's the, that's the kind of review that the companies are interested in, because you are being, you are being honest. Um, we know about these uh, flaws, if you can call them flaws, or downsides, or whatever. But uh, there are things that, as long as it's overall a uh, good review, technically good review, then it's something that the user will definitely choose to, to buy for the product. So I say it's something completely essential for any hardware company to have their products reviewed in at least one important website per, per main client uh, country. Like it can be the UK, US, or Spain, for example. 
Okay. Right, I think that that pretty much sums up. Thank you very much, Lucio, oh, for, for a, a bit more of a uh, bit more insight into our industry. Then, so um, I will finish if I can get the Mac working again. With uh, any questions. Hi, uh, Anthony. Uh, you know, that's like a. Uh, we say it's a post PC era. Most of the thing you review, you you read reviews about, is that the components that you choose one by one. It's like you choose one single motherboard, GPU, CPU, and, and all that. But now, like now, we are getting just like notebooks and laptops and and, and tablet devices. Where, where where is it going? What do you think it's going to happen with review? Because you know, you know, like single device. How many reviews can you write about uh, a new a new Apple PC? Not 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 what uh, computer. Not not a lot. Same with Android devices and that. So how do you think it's gonna go on? Like controllers, everything that computers are getting smaller. Like five campus party uh, ago, you would see like everyone had a mid tower PC, but now you just can see a few. Most of them you just bring the, the laptops on. What do you think is gonna happen? So I think he's uh, referring to um, you know, is the PC industry shrinking? Um, yes, it is. Uh, but I think it's for uh, it's for lots of different reasons. It's not just because tablets are becoming more popular I mean yes they're kind of you know taking over some of the market share but um, I think there's there's lots of different reasons it's um, you know people are looking for a cheaper way to get on the internet um, so you know a tablet is obviously a lot cheaper than well in most cases than a um, you know a sort of mid-range PC um, you can game on tablets as well um, and uh, and things like that but I think the um, PC's kind of had a had a bit of a, bit of a rough ride but it's, it's been there for so long that I, I don't think it's it's going anywhere permanently um, I think the sales are, you know, are reducing for the simple reason that people don't want to spend, you know, eight hundred, a thousand pounds on a on a PC when they can spend, you know, three or four hundred on a, on a tablet and do most of the things that they can with the PC. Uh, but I'd argue that there's there's always going to be some things that you can only do on a PC than you can um, on, on a lap, on a, a tablet. I mean, I uh, I use a, an iPad quite regularly at home, but for you know for typing, com uh, communicating, and, and look. For the most part, sort of creating things. If you're creating content, it's much, much easier to use a PC or maybe a laptop uh, to do that. So I think while we'll see, you know, PC numbers reduce, I think for at least the next decade or so, until something else comes along other than a tablet, um, I think, you know, I think I said in a, one of my recent Forbes articles, maybe Google Glass might, you know, do some crazy uh, mind game thing where, you know, you can type words with just thinking them or something like that. But it's, um, yeah, I, I don't think the PC is going anywhere. There's, there's certainly fewer numbers even this year compared to uh, when I was in Campus Party Madrid a few years ago. There's fewer PCs, I think, here than there were then. But, yeah, I, I don't think it's going, going anywhere. As far as te technology journalism that's related to PCs, go, um, it, is that going to disappear? I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not worried about my job at the moment. Um, there's certainly way too much stuff coming through the door so uh, for, for me to review. And people are still interested. You know, we're still, you know, the traffic's still up on our website. We're still selling lots of magazines. And, um, yeah, people are still interested. So I think while the numbers are declining, I think, yeah, I, I don't think the industry is going to fall flat in its face. I think, you know, far from it, I think. So, any other questions? Thank you. Have you ever had um, companies dictate how they would like to have their products reviewed by you? And what have the consequences been? <laughs> we, we get um, accused of this more often than you think, actually. Um, like there's the uh, the Intel processor question at the moment. Intel is so dominant in the processor market that um, you know people think that just because we give all of their processors good reviews that they're uh, you know they're paying you know backhanders or that kind of thing. And it's you know nothing could be further further from the truth. You know, um, ten years ago we were rec uh, or a bit longer we were rec recommending AMD products. Um, so it's just we we like to think that we're honest, uh, unbiased, and um, and that kind of thing. So as far as individual reviews go, uh, and you know instances we have we have had uh, people say you know can you send your review to us first before you know you post it, um, or you know try and say oh well if if you can give us a good review we'll give you a bit more advertising or we might look more favourably on you in future, but. That's that's not how to get a um, a large you know community following. If people have the slightest hint that you're being given backhanders to give good reviews, they they just won't visit your website. I mean, the reason why people go to uh, websites like ours is to see honest reviews. You know, they they've got some money, they want to buy a new graphics card or a new computer monitor. They want an unbiased review to tell them whether it's good or bad. Um, so I think from that point of view, it's um, 
it's something that we, we, we tend to avoid posting, sending a reviewer um, our review of their product beforehand. Um, if, if it's a first, a first review for a company, we might sort of you know, give them a hint about what we've written. Uh, we certainly contact them if, they've got, if we've had any problems with the product. We don't just post something if it's maybe broken. Um, but yeah, we do tend to avoid you know, any kind of you know, backhanders or anything like that. We, we've never done it to my, to my knowledge. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just not, for, not professional really, so. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question. Animal. Yeah, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> you know, obviously in big tech now, uh, you, you have the fame that you go to a company and so want to review one of your products, and if they know their website, they'll say no problem. But before you were with big tech, I mean, I don't really know your, your, your review in past, did you ever have trouble um, when you would contact a company and say, we would like to review your products, and they would, they would say no? I mean, I, I ask because, we do get a lot of, as you can imagine, we do get a lot of requests, and obviously we, we can't we can't afford to send stuff to everyone. Yeah. So we do have to turn some down. But I just wonder, in your from your from your point of view, how do you overcome that problem when someone says no and everybody starts saying no, and eventually someone I imagine says yes? But how do you fill up the content on your website when uh, when the companies won't participate because you don't have enough? Uh, where visits, for example. Yeah, so so you mean like if you're just starting out, how do you get yeah. how do you get products for review if you have got like an established community? Yes. Um, yeah, that that is that is a difficult one. I think that's one of the reasons why there's not very many hardware review sites out there really in the overall scheme of things, because um, you know companies you know these days especially they what they want to see some kind of um, uh, you know some kind of presence, your online presence. You need a certain number of hits on your website. You need a good community. Like if you've got just got you know a hundred members in your forum, that's not really kind of selling your website, is it? So I think BitTech's got you know tens of thousands at least. I think so. Um, as far as actually getting the products, I think um, you can try and give the company an, an exclusive. Um, you can maybe show them some some examples of other work. Uh, that you've done. So uh, obviously, you know, I mentioned earlier about getting, you know, getting a blog going. It's just about getting getting your presence known, really. So even if you do like an internship for a magazine, just to get your presence known, um, even if you're not being paid, because um, companies, as you say, they they can be quite tight with products that they send out. You know, especially in this day and age, they can't send it to everybody like they used to. They'll just pick and choose a few companies. You know, select companies with good proven track records uh, to send it to. So. Um, if you can, I suggest coming to events like this. Um, there are a lot of big trade shows as well. Um, and uh, in the UK, we have something called iSeries, which is like a big LAN party event. Um, so if you meet the people there, you know, the PRs for the companies and explain who you are, see them face to face and that kind of thing, that, that can really help your corner rather than just sending an email um, or lots of emails as people to or just badgering them on social media. Because, yeah. um, you know, they get hundreds of people doing that, just, start look, just looking for a free bit of hardware. But you need to explain that, you know, you are genuine, you're going to review their product properly, um, explain how you're going to test it, you know, are you going to photograph it or, you know, that kind of thing and where it's going to appear. Um, it's also a good idea to maybe post your reviews in forums as well. Um, so uh, at least then you've got you know some way of kind of expressing yourself to a larger community, and you can link back, just send or send the manufacturer all the links of the places that you review things. So um, there are ways of doing it. It can be difficult, but as I say, probably actually meeting the your local PR person, for example, for Lamtron or um, Intel or Corsair or you know any of these you know local PRs, they they do have them in most countries, you know around the world. Most countries in Europe do. Um, even you know Australia and people like that. Some of the bigger companies they will have local PR people that you can meet and greet, yeah. and, go, and go from that kind of thing. So, oh, thank yeah. you. You're talking a lot about the community. You know, you have a big community in big tech, but you know the forums they used to be very important. You got your job because you were in the forums, but now it seems like it is everything is moving. That kind of social interaction is moving. From, uh, from the forums to social media and Facebook. Are you noticing that, that your traffic from the, we choose to be on the forums is now on your Facebook page or, or Twitter? Or? Um, that's a good question, actually. It's, um, I don't think our forum, I don't think our forum contents dip that much, but uh, I mean, there's certainly a massive presence online now for, you know, if, not just for the, the, tech, the tech journalists, but for the companies involved as well. I mean, um, some of the companies I, you know, I sort of work with, they've got, you know, sort of hundreds of thousands of likes on their on their Facebook pages and things like that. So, um, I think it's, um, 
yeah, it's it's a difficult question to answer really because I think uh, the whole social media thing is kind of coming on top of everything else. So whereas people before were just looking on forums and with the rest of their time they were doing something else, now they tend to fill that time with social media. Especially if you know if you're travelling on the train or something, it's much easier to look at Facebook or Twitter than it is to look on a computer forum. So I think whereas you know. There is a lot more uh, people are spending a lot more time on social media websites these days. I don't think it's eating into the time that they would spend elsewhere as much as people think it is. So, yeah, that, that's that's pretty much how I'd answer that. I think. <laughs> you see a lot of people getting sponsored on the forums, and there's also forums that actually um, that actually says that you have to pay if you're getting sponsored. How do you see sponsorships um, affecting case mod forums, and what are your views on people maybe stealing a bit of your ads, the the, the money you could earn on ads by getting sponsored in their work logs? Yeah, um, sponsorship for anybody that doesn't know is um, basically your um, uh, you contact a company or a contact even uh, company even contacts you, uh, offering to give you sort of free hardware to put in your uh, in your computer mod. Um, so obviously it saves you having to buy the gear, but in return the company is getting advertising for their hardware essentially. Um, it's um, yeah, it's it's always been a bit of a contentious issue because some people, you know, their local PR will be a bit more friendly than someone else's. They're more willing to give the hardware, um, but it's. Um, it, yeah, as I say, it, it is a difficult one in that um, people look at uh, sponsored mods as maybe a bit more favor favorably than someone with old hardware. So, um, and uh, yeah, so they'll they'll get more traffic. The companies will be more interested in them, and you know they tend to do better better in our you know competitions like uh, we have on BitTech. You know, if you have a nice PC filled with all the latest hardware, um, it's possibly you know not as sexy to coin a phrase to than you know a PC that uses a couple of couple of years old hardware. So from that point of view, it's it's difficult to kind of discern between the two. But we try and sort of find the middle ground. But with um, with advertising and sort of sponsorship in general, I think I, I don't think it would be right to kind of get rid of it entirely um, because it, it is a great way to kind of support the PC modding community. Um, you know, companies kind of you know they see that it's a great way to market their products, um, and uh, yeah, so it's um, I, I wouldn't want to get rid of it. Um, and uh, as far as companies sort of you know getting advertising through it and things like that, it's um, it's a, it is a bit of a grey area because on one hand I like to see uh, modders like you know Lucy Allen and yourself hands kind of um, you know be you know supported and uh, kind of get given the hardware and things like that. But on the other hand, we also like to try and support you know the people that are you know don't. They, they're not interested in sponsorship. They'll just use, you know, their ten-year-old hardware, but the outside of the case looks amazing. So, um, but yeah, it's it, it is a very, very contentious issue. I'm, I'm not not too keen to sort of get involved in the in the finer details of it. But I think as far as the advertising thing goes, um, so what did you mean by sort of stealing advertising? Sorry, yeah, I was just going to come back to, come back to him about the uh, the stealing point. Um, you have uh, ads on your website, which is uh, generated by many of these companies that sponsors the work locks. Okay. Yeah. And I know that some websites says that they don't want ads in their work locks because they can just they will lose their traffic, and the money they will generate from ads. Okay. So so if you put like a like a company logo in a in a project log, it is that kind of thing. It would. Yeah. It's it's it, it's probably much cheaper for a company to sponsor a fan controller to a modder and then get 100,000 views. I see. Right, yeah. So you're basically saying that if you've got the ads in the project log and that's getting lots of views, why bother paying advertising on a website? Yeah, I think it's... Um, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't noticed, you know, sort of too much that, you know, that going on. I think because they're, um, the forum and the website tend to be two very different places. Um, we find that a lot of people just will just set our forum homepage... I'm uh, sorry, our forum as their homepage. They won't even look... Uh, BitTech homepage, which is not great for us because we like to drive lots of traffic to the homepage. So we've thought of lots of ideas to try and get, you know, kind of mingle the two or just get people out of the forum, having having a look at the website, generating some traffic and generating some advertising revenue for us. So I think uh, for the most part, certainly on BitTech, we're not too concerned by it because as I, as I say, the, the forum, uh, the big community forum and the website are usually two very separate things. Um, so there will be adverts in the forum kind of on the on the surrounding page on the uh, on the headers, but um, in general, when you kind of go into a project log, you're, you're not really looking at those. You're kind of looking at the um, 
at the project log itself and the, the links are usually a bit further down so I think if we if we had a project log on the front page we did use to list all the um, the advertisements in the in the project log so anybody that sponsored a project log that we feature on our front page we used to feature the advertisers in there so we're not doing that anymore uh, for pretty much for the reason that you said because obviously it's not fair that someone pays X amount for you know big adverts at the side of the, of the website um, and uh, whereas someone who sponsors as you say like a 50 pound fan controller gets a logo that's nearly as big but still a clickable link to their website for yeah, as I say, a £50 fan controller. So that's something that we tend not to do anymore. Uh, we, we might put links to companies that have sponsored a project, like we might you know, just write them out, but we won't have like a big logo in the article like we used to. So, yeah. Sorry, I got a, as you brought mine, I'm yep. gonna comment on that one. Um, it's also a, a very difference. I mean, I know, I know exactly what you mean, but uh, from a company side of view, normally when we decide to sponsor someone, it's not so much about the publicity, like like a banner would generate on a website. It's more about the fact, like if you yourself make a, a really good looking mod and you and you add one of our controllers, for example. Now the person that looks at that mod is going to think that fan controller looks amazing in your in your project. So in, instantly they would they would get into their heads that whether it's true or not, that that fan controller will look amazing in their computer. So instead of having a banner where it's potential customers, it's more about um, having a few customers, like maybe two, three sales out of it. And so it, it, for us, it's very little, it's very different in terms of uh, what policy do we make. For example, we may still or may not have a banner on a website regardless of the, of the banners on the, on the work logs. Okay, any other questions? I think we're pretty much done. Thank you very much, Anthony. Can I get a round of applause for Anthony, please? Thank you. At four o'clock, we'll have Colin Cunningham with a session on mega telescopes. Thank you very much.